And now it's the moment you've all been waiting for. On your chairs, you'll find a thinly disguised sales leaflet encouraging you to buy a copy of the tremendous um, uh, innovations uh, report. And uh, to tell you all about it, in fact, to give us some of the key themes that emerge in that report, please welcome um, a, a very early and long-standing friend of this conference, partner at Innovation Media Consulting Group, Juan Senor. Juan. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. So the book this year really uh, contains uh, 12, uh, 12 cases um, about innovation uh, really uh, throughout the magazine world. Um, it really, uh, this year has it's been a very interesting process. As you know, we started this with FIP uh, seven years ago. And slowly we're moving from uh, prognostication, from making all kinds of predictions to really uh, a very prescriptive way forward. And it's very exciting how this year we've been able to pick up on exactly uh, the same uh, theme. Um, this comes from uh, 12 months of research of our entire team at Innovation Globally, but as well um, the, uh, the, 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 the experience that we garner uh, working with many of you uh, throughout the world. And as I said, uh, there is a clear uh, way forward to rebuild this business. And in these 129 pages, you have uh, phenomenal insights to, to, to take you into these new innovative uh, directions. But for me at the moment, this is a lot of what's going on. <laughs> it's a publishing elephant trying to dance to so many digital tunes. And with the book, we were very strict about trying to bring clarity as to which tunes, you're still an elephant, which tunes you have to choose to dance to, and even what music you can begin to score for you to dance to, which is, you know, is, is a big paradigm change from us just reacting and trying to adapt to now perhaps beginning to indeed score some of these tracks that will drive our business. So these are the seven key insights, seven keys to success that we've gone this year. I begin at the end, so if you have to go, uh, this is it. Uh, this is pretty much a summary of the book. But of course, these are insights that drive a lot of the case studies that you will find here, uh, and I will go into a bit of detail. Number one, uh, the days when digital had the audience, but not the revenue, are over. And this is very, very important for us to get our heads around it. Uh, because uh, up until now, everybody's been criticizing this digital pure plays because they just get the, the crowds, uh, and yet they do not get the revenue. But now we're beginning to see that once you get rid of that free culture of free for everything, indeed, if you do build a digital, sizable audience, the money does come. So now we can indeed argue that volume leads to value, while up until now, uh, the revenue still was uh, with uh, print. Um, the display digital ad business model only, that is dead. If your strategy is too uh, leverage on that, if there's too much of your revenue in digital coming from display ad, reconsider and change it quickly, because that follows from number one that indeed the free culture where we just built an audience and got people to come and we just sold eyeballs to display advertisers, that is dead. So we must move away from that uh, quickly. Those two things uh, do go together. And in the book we show you how people are making that transformation very cleverly, very quickly. The third one, and we're still a bit puzzled as to why there's so much discussion or debate or confusion or existential uh, problems with this, uh, we don't see any and we see phenomenal upside and very little downside. Distributed content, putting your content on other platforms, particularly social media platforms, to us is a must, is a no-brainer, but provided you can control it. So we show in the book some of the best uh, case studies as to who's doing this and how. Mobile, mobile. A lot of talk about mobile, but perhaps in the book, uh, uh, we begin to see the best cases and the first cases where they're really approaching mobile as a new medium. It's no longer the platform, it's the medium. And this has phenomenal implications as well. And the first one is that you have to have different content for different platform. And this is the first case, I'll go into detail as to what that means. 
And number five, very interesting, uh, the mantra for many, many years, for decades, has been that our brands, our content has to be always on. And in the book, we argue that perhaps that's incorrect. It's not just always on, it's on at the right time. And with mobile, we see exactly what that means. I'll go into detail. And this is a lot of insight we picked up from Google as to how they program for mobile. It's not always on. It's not always just uh, rushing. It's just being at the right time, at the right place in terms of device, particularly your mobile, with the right narrative and story. You don't really, really need to be always on. Number six, only physical change can bring about conceptual change. And look, I'm just back from California. Go to Facebook headquarters. They spend billions with Frank Gehry redesigning every single millimeter with phenomenal attention to workflows, to people flow, to how people interact, to how do I get to talk to those people, to how those people can bump into me so we can create content and so on. Drive past Apple. They're building a massive, massive new space which is all based on a new physical conceptualization of the working space for creating content or digital narrative. So physical change is essential. And we're seeing that the best cases of transformation really uh, begin uh, because there was a move somewhere. They moved homes, and that made a huge difference. But of course, that requires phenomenal uh, thinking through. But physical change is the best way we found to bring about conceptual change. And finally, and this is a very interesting one, and again, quite contrarian, but a, a very interesting insight. Um, We've been talking for a long time about metrics, metrics, metrics. But metrics measure the past. And we really have to look ahead to stay competitive. So in the book, we talk about trend spotting, trend watching. Because the metrics we've got, most of us have our heads around it. But again, we're measuring how what we do was received, played out, was engaged. But the most interesting thing that we talk about in this book is trend spotting. And this, again, brings us back to the importance of editors, of listening to your editors and listening to your staff, and not just be a slave to metrics that tell you what happened in the past, even if it's a recent past. But how do you then get to trend spotting and trend watching? How do you do that in an effective way? So a very important insight this year uh, that we've seen some publishers picking up on and developing uh, great content and great products as a result. Now, seven insights, uh, five cases ever so quickly now. I'll begin with uh, mobile. H how do we make mobile the success that it should be? Um, the book this year, incidentally, is all based on how to, how to, how to. So through the pages, we, 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 we follow that approach of, of, of listing uh, the content in a numerical order. And again, uh, this is not just a platform. This really is a new medium. And it requires different content for different platforms. So how do you succeed? First, advertising and content that is totally unique and tailored to the mobile experience is the only way to stand out and to succeed. Uh, we've gone inside. We looked under the bonnet of those mobile uh, pure players that are emerging right now. And this is how they begin their entire process of programming, mobile programming, they call it, content programming, and advertising. They will only accept advertising that really works for the mobile platform. And they will be very, very reluctant to just take on the good old display advertising that media agencies are pushing on them. And that means content that is easy to scroll, to tap, to click, to swipe. It's easy for you to share, to talk about. It has the right amount of motion, the right length. Responsive does not work. If your approach to mobile has just been responsive, really get your head around this because it doesn't work. And here's why it doesn't. Because responsive presumes that desktop is the starting point. When you talk to mobile pure players, they say, why would I even begin a mobile strategy uh, with a responsive approach? Digital first is presuming that desktop is the ultimate uh, destination. 
So you have to create standalone, seamless mobile experiences. Uh, and it's not just about optimizing responsive uh, web experience and, and having good old landing pages uh, and content for the smallest screen or basic branded apps. Uh, look how deep it has to be, because this is responsive. We go from that screen, perhaps to middle screen, to then end with a little screen. So you essentially are PDFing down, zooming down uh, a version of an experience, and it never works, and it doesn't work. What we propose and what we've seen as the key insight for you to take away in terms of how to re -begin, uh, begin to, to rethink your, your content is, is a mobile-first uh, approach, a mobile-only approach in terms of design, where the beginning is that device to eventually do take us to desktop. So you have to go mobile-only. And how, how do you do that? How do you create a mobile-only experience? We well, have to build around two mobile moments. And this is what I mean by frequency. Because if you're always on, if you're always spitting out the content, but you don't take into consideration that mobile has a very uh, clear experiential aspect to it, it's very difficult to do the content properly. So this is, to me, one of the most exciting things I picked up this year. And, and it was wonderful to, to, to sit down with Google and to, to share it with, with them and to indeed uh, get my head around it, yes? So it's about building an entire mobile strategy on two moments, the micro moments and the me moments. What are micro moments? According to Google and according to Facebook, these are micro moments, the I want moments. This is something you expect your mobile device to give you back. I want something, I need something, I go to my mobile to get it. I want to know something, that's a moment. I want to go somewhere, that's a moment. What's in the movies, I need to go to a restaurant, I need to get to the airport. I want to do moments, I need to get this thing done, I need to uh, organize myself or something. I want to buy moments, yes? So look, look how, how different the platforms is and how active and proactive it is as opposed to so passive of a desktop screen, yes? So mobile content programming and mobile strategic uh, programming is very much, first of all, based on this I want moments. And second, the me moments. Me moments. Where consumers really do sit down with the device, they lean back with it, whether it's at night, on a long journey, uh, or they have a bit more time with it, but they do have the time, and they want to watch uh, a television show even, but they want to watch something longer, they want to read something longer, and they want to engage in specific activities. This is completely opposite to micro moments. So as you can see, these two micro moments and these two me moments are totally different to approaching this whole thing as an always on, let's go, let's spit it out, uh, without taking into consideration the user experience of mobile, and that's where things go wrong. So if you look at Quartz, which was here presenting last year, if you look at Refinery29, this is often their starting and their ending point when it comes to developing a mobile strategy. So quickly, six rules for mobile content, uh, which I think are worth sharing. Uh, let mobile behaviors, again, guide the content creation and organization. What I talked about just now, hyper-relevant, easy to navigate, uh, customizable. Uh, do not have too large visuals that eat up uh, the bandwidth and the time. Second, you have to make it expandable. Um, the content has to be presented uh, and, and articulated in a way that you can get a snippet of it and then the longer version of it. So in the micro moment, you have the I need this information right now, boom, that's it, I got it. And then later on, it can expand and I want this me moment where I you know, dig deep into this and I get the whole experience. So design a concept that indeed you can tap and swipe for a larger experience is very, very important. Uh, expanding it into apps. Eventually, if a bit of content has track, it is demonstrable and we've seen uh, throughout uh, the world and in many cases uh, that that's the moment where you can indeed uh, go along with an app, not before. And indeed, a, a lot of that uh, content that is relevant uh, through Snapchat and through Instagram as well, expanding it into yours and other apps as well. 
SMS mobile alerts uh, in your niches. Uh, we've seen that people right now are accepting them. And when I mean SMS, it's not just mobile uh, GMS system where they come through your telephone. Uh, SMS could also be a WhatsApp message uh, calling you to indeed uh, go somewhere and read something on a me moment or in a micro moment. Joining the video bandwagon, very, very important. Uh, you really have to uh, uh, do mobile that is of high interest uh, to your readers. Uh, I'll talk about mobile in a moment. And finally, uh, segmenting your emails. We know that emailing uh, is being described as a cockroach of the, of the internet. We cannot kill it off. It keeps coming back uh, to great effect. Uh, indeed, it's still uh, working very well. But our emails are very text heavy uh, with a phenomenal amount of distractions. Uh, the purity of making something uh, uh, straightforward and fast to read with action buttons that are easy to interact with, it's key to indeed uh, reinventing your mobile experience. So again, micro moments and me moments, a very different narrative from everything we've heard up until now of just, oh, quickly, buy some responsive software, get everything out there, uh, keep going, it's fast, mobile is always on, it's, mobile is mobile. So you have to be there with the audiences, just, just pause for thought, uh, take this on board, and really rethink that your audience wants the content to be used and experienced in those micro moments and in those me moments. Next, uh, let's talk about distributed content, because there's a great deal, as I said at the beginning, of existential angst, uh, confusion, problems about this. And our take this year on this is that this is a must. You must engage with this opportunity. Uh, forget this good old, oh, you know, remember Google, if we go with Google, f your friend or foe. No, there is now a, a very exciting way for you to engage with this. And frequency is now everything when it comes to these platforms. Uh, the amount of frequency and the amount uh, of the time that you have to upload and update content on these platforms is phenomenal. So it has tremendous implications as to how your editorial office engages with this, uh, with these uh, devices and these new platforms, yeah? And we start with the question, if you could indeed sell more of your content, in another platform, wouldn't you do it? Yeah. If you could put your content on Netflix, on eBay, on iTunes, if somebody came to you and said, would you like to? Of course we would. Big brands, they're doing it already. They're selling on other distribution platforms. They're not having second thoughts. So Disney, uh, the Beatles Library, uh, Gucci, other brands. Uh, why not media? Why are we not really doing this? And you know, an interesting comment from a colleague of ours saying, if CVS, a huge uh, network of pharmacies, came up to the New York Times and said, we would like to place your newspapers uh, within our uh, network of pharmacies throughout America, they wouldn't say, oh, yeah, but don't worry, are you losing control? But two big caveats, yeah? The ad format control and the revenue share is essential. That has been respected. As you know, Facebook, Twitter, Apple, they're on a charming offensive. They're going out there to all of you publishers, talking to you, saying, come on board, come on board. Uh, but you must control these two aspects, the ad format control, the revenue share, and, and having rich audience data. And so far, there's been a big deal of success extracting this and guaranteeing this from them uh, going forward. So why do it, really? Existentially, why go to social platforms? Look, it's the number one activity, activity online in every country. <laughs> it's the number one activity. So we talk about micro moments, me moments. Those micro moments, me moments, a lot of them happen through social networking, yes? And the referral rate is phenomenal. Yeah. Facebook alone is 38%, much more than Google. So they are huge audiences, the speed of delivery, they have phenomenal servers and uh, incredible algorithms that make our content fly through and you are able to read it in a way that is a wonderful experience and, and massive sharing potential, yes? Apple and Facebook have already uh, given 70% uh, of ad revenue to many publishers and Facebook is sharing Comscore data with us. Apple not yet, so if you start negotiations with them, uh, work hard to get that data. Uh, but it's happening and they're sharing it so far and contractually is guaranteed and you can always pull out. 
So, uh, the, and some interesting rules that have been forced uh, recently, and indeed there should be some common purpose here in Germany and throughout Europe to get some of these. Uh, but in the States, uh, more ads per story have been able to be guaranteed. Uh, Facebook only ads have been okayed. And related articles at the moment, including sponsored content, uh, have also been okayed, which is good for you because if you like this, you may want to read that. So, you have that opportunity as well to put that at the bottom and to insert the branded content ads from your clients. And all that inventory that sits at the bottom, uh, you can sell it through programmatic and you can share from that as well. So uh, the results are fascinating and indeed uh, um, the results are there. Some publishers are making as much today on Facebook as they do on their own websites, let alone their mobile uh, versions, yes? Um, Business Insider, we just heard, um, phenomenal um, results so far in terms of monetization. The audience is a no-brainer. It's there and they will read your content and they'll consume it and they'll share it. Wonderful. But again, uh, we must get to the revenue, as I said at the very beginning. Atlantic, 60 to 70% of their content has already been distributed through these social platforms. Slate, 100%. Perhaps that's a bit extreme, but indeed they're doing it, yes? The problems is not cheap uh, for, or easy. Uh, remember, you do need to uh, recode a lot of this content so it transfers to these platforms easily. Uh, they help you initially, but it does take an additional uh, link in that workflow, the daily workflow. Uh, each platform has different technology, which is a problem sometimes. And indeed, uh, not all ad formats are accepted. And no ads on native video. So if you have a native video ad client that has an ad in there, unfortunately, it doesn't play out. And some limits on things like Outbrain, but uh, Outbrain is so, uh, has lost so much reputation at the moment that it's okay. We can, I'm sure, live without that, yes? So our advice in the book, uh, surmised from the early adopters of this, is indeed uh, jump into this. Jump into perhaps just one platform at the beginning. Perhaps Facebook might be the best choice and test it, see what happens. And you can expand or pull back as results indicate. But a wonderful um, opportunity. And really, really, let's get over this hang up of our past experiences with Google and our past experiences with other digital players who took our audience and our business away. Uh, there is business to be made here. Uh, and Facebook is as interested uh, as perhaps we are, uh, perhaps, uh, in uh, guaranteeing uh, the success of our brands. So indeed, uh, we do see a very exciting viability to this dilemma with the industry. I want to talk now about micropayments. Micropayments, which is something that perhaps not a lot of us talk about uh, often, but we're seeing as one of the key insights this year that is beginning to have phenomenal traction and something that you should all be exploring with. And as I said at the beginning, uh, these days when digital just had the audience but don't know the revenue are over, and uh, with micropayments, with digital wallets, we're beginning to see what, why that is and what that means, yes? So, and again, if display digital business model only is dead, that means reader revenue. We have to explore how to get people to pay for some of our content. So, the critics of micropayments have been out there for a number of years. Uh, they said, look, this has been tried and failed. But we always point out to a lot of these digital experiments, why are we so critical of it? Initial failure does not preclude an ultimate success. How many auto companies failed experimenting at the beginning, trying to find a business model, an engine, a chassis, uh, a carriage that indeed uh, worked, it was acceptable, it was price sensitive? Look, 381. That many were experimenting in, that, in those 25 years. And they've said, well, they're doomed because the mental transaction costs are there. People have spent 25 years and everything's been free on the internet. And now we're asking them to pay. It'll never work. They're saying it's a complicated system. And of course, uh, the friction and the discomfort of paying online and loading up your credit card uh, details are a nightmare. Yeah? Well, all this has been swept away. Yes, iTunes has changed all that. And we're beginning to see digital wallets emerge, I'm sure a good 20, if not 30% of all of you are now making uh, digital payments 
regularly, whether it's through contactless or through Apple Pay, uh, there's Google Pay, uh, PayPal is everywhere now. So these payments, these digital wallets are very much here to stay. And of course, they're being backed by these big organizations uh, in Silicon Valley. And uh, indeed, uh, we must begin to experiment on how that would work with our content, yes? Uh, and when it comes to its application to our industry, as you know, there's Blendle, there's Imoneza, uh, these uh, four, four of the players, two of the four players who target this. Uh, Blendle, as you know, is aggregating content uh, from most uh, of the magazines and newspapers in one country. They charge a fee of, of $20 on average. Uh, uh, one Pass also uh, has uh, a similar model of a click to pay for every story. I'm Monetz is another one, etc. Talking to uh, Blendle, I know they've been here. I know we've listened to them over the years. Perhaps they're not taking off uh, at the speed, but do, do not rule these guys out. Do not rule this opportunity out because they are proving that people are willing to pay uh, for great journalism. They already have more than half a million people doing so. They're moving into the States, uh, moving into France, and indeed people are picking up. And these are the iTunes generation under the age of 35, more than happy to make these quick uh, transactions. But four lessons we've learned from Blendle and from others. Number one, uh, micropayments for journalism will work, but not for breaking news. No problem. Second, uh, readers punish clickbait creators by demanding refunds. So if indeed you get into this game and you just give them clickbait, all these, you know, the 10 most uh, uh, beautiful uh, people, the, the, the five great dresses, the, uh, that, that's a nightmare. That listicle approach, uh, that clickbaiting, uh, it, it doesn't work. Micropayments are a great measure of quality, uh, psychologically, and for you internally to know what's working, what is really people are willing to pay for. It's a fantastic uh, signal as to what journalism you should invest more time and effort and resources into, yes? And it's additional revenue, not cannibalization. Next, uh, let me talk about uh, what I said at the beginning, the importance, the importance of trend spotting versus metric obsessing. And again, uh, we, in our work with our clients, we spend a great deal of time working on newsroom metrics and trying to get the editorial team to, to watch the right metrics and to act upon those metrics. But I think we need to go further than this into trend spotting. So how do you spot a trend? We've gone out, we've talked to people who have been successful because at the end of the day, this is what publishers did. Publishers had great editors and great people, from Henry Luce to the lady who founded Cosmopolitan, who just picked up something in the air. And they said, my audience, these women, uh, these guys, uh, those fishermen, those hunters, those tennis obsessed people will want this kind of content, this magazine. And they went to a publisher and they said, let's publish something. And this seems to be lost because we're all obsessed with looking back rather than looking as, at, at what could be ahead. So important to look around you a bit more. Stop looking at those screens so much. Look around. And it's fantastic. There is a, one of the leading advertisers here, agencies here in Germany. It's in Hamburg. And when you walk into their office, their reception room is a German's average family, uh, uh, average uh, uh, German uh, family's um, living room. And when you go into the canteen, is the average kitchen of a family in Germany. The mantra being, and they change it all the time. So if this year there's a PlayStation, and uh, then they put a PlayStation there. And the idea is that if you're creating content and sending messages to this average German family, you better live in their environs and understand what's going on. But we're doing very little of this. And it's essential for our business that we recover it. So look around you and monitor trending hashtags. If you really want to continue to obsess with metrics, look at hashtags. Look at these trends of what people are saying. Okay, that, 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 that has traction, that has traction, that has traction. And pay attention to one younger staffers your people are wearing, they're talking about, they're doing in their spare time. And keep an eye on consumer sales good figures. Uh, this is interesting. We picked up this benchmark, which is an interesting one. When 5% of your audience has a new device, is already buying that device, and it is growing in double digits month on month, then go full on. Because you know that when it's, when it's peaking or when it's, uh, you know, when, it, when it's really a, a trend that is now established and your audience is demanding content, you'll be there at the right moment with that audience. 
So a very interesting insight we picked up in terms of how do you do trend setting with technology. And the trend at the moment and the future, of course, we heard about it a lot here, virtual reality. Yes. But just because a technology comes along doesn't mean that we have to use it. Yeah? And, and we've had problems. Remember, you know, IMAX theaters and 3D. So if you do it, do it full on. Don't, don't and of course, uh, in this case, this one is coming. It's coming big. So we would advise that you do it full on, but with proper narrative. And we just heard the case of the New York Times. Fascinating. They partner with Google uh, uh, with a couple of devices to subscribers. I was just with Google. Uh, they will sell you that box for a very reduced price, and they'll brand it. Yeah. So they'll put your logo on it. And they're very keen to partner with publishers. And I think uh, this one is a win-win for both you and them in terms of the device. Uh, this has been the most successful app launch ever for the New York Times, uh, sponsored by GE, as you saw in the previous presentation, and Mini. Uh, the content is brilliant, it's fascinating. People spend more than 15 minutes uh, perusing the content, and uh, it's already margin positive uh, for the New York Times in their first outing with this, yes? And the second thing, when it comes to trend spotting, which I hinted at before, listen, listen to your editors. And many of them are here, and you're not listening to them. <laughs> and they were, in the past, the great trend spotters. And you have to sit down with them again and trust their instinct, because it is their instinct that built our business. We created great brands based on the one guy's bet, one guy's insight, saying, Go with People Magazine. That's what America needs now. Go in this country with Landlust. I mean, Landlust. How on earth would you have gotten that from metrics, from watching trends? No. It's a great editor saying, I want to create, I want to, uh, Germans long, they lost for the land. Uh, they want to get out of this big urban metropolis. They want to get back to getting their hands dirty and, and, and making pots and, and, and feeding chickens. And, 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 and Landlust is born. Phenomenal success, and there's very little of this going on. So, a wonderful example this year is Mondadori. Um, they indeed uh, picked up on a devoted community, uh, people excited about the Pope, and they created uh, Il Mio Papa <laughs> with three million copy run. And that's an editor. That's an editor going to Mondadori without any metrics, saying, "Excuse me, Il Papa." This guy deserves a magazine, you know, and, and you do it. So a wonderful example of how we need to bring this back, these conversations on a regular basis with our editors, journalists as well, but especially editors who've seen it and done it all and indeed can give you this business idea and this is the result. It's not just all technology uh, trend spotting. Uh, this is trends that are here to stay, and I bet you this magazine is going to last uh, quite a while, given uh, his performance so far. Atlantic Media has also done it recently with, uh, this is more B2B, but uh, with Defense One. Fantastic uh, piece of content and insight. Again, it came when we talked to them, we sat down with them, it came from an editor saying, boom, here, let's go now. And they do it, and indeed a phenomenal success. Let me begin to conclude by talking about video. Video, video, so, so important. And um, the web now is a visual medium. Really, it is a visual medium. What really started as a text-based medium and what we first adopted as, a, 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 as, a, as skeuomorphism, we just took our content and we put it in this new device, it, it's gone now, it's moved on, it's developed, it's evolved into really a web uh, that it really demands and people expect from it uh, visual experiences, pictures in motion, 80% of all content, 80% of all content consumed online in just a few years will be video. So we really look into this in detail because the money is there. The money is flowing there. So when I talked about digital, having digital audience but not having the revenue, those days are over. They're mostly over because of this, because a lot of that revenue is coming from this. This is completely debunked, uh, the revenue you could ever get from display advertising, yes? 
but not so fast. Videos can be extremely expensive and complicated to produce. So in the book, we go into a lot of detailed case studies as to who's, who's doing video how and some of the best innovations out there. They can be difficult to make profitably. Why? Bandwidth. The video platform streaming uh, that you need to acquire or in, if, if you need to be with somebody else's platform. Uh, the content acquisition in many cases if you don't really have uh, the opportunity to have that content right away. Uh, the staffing needed, the gear. I mean, uh, you know, if you look at those 360 cameras, I saw plenty of them in California. Uh, they go from very, very thin and you think, oh, that, oh, it's cheaper. No, it's like three times more expensive. So the thinner, as opposed to the big one, the CinemaScope uh, 360 cameras, um, they're phenomenally uh, expensive. So yes, video, but at what cost and how? And this is very interesting insight. 10% of your posted video will generate almost all of your pre-roll revenue. Which 10%? <laughs> There's no way for you to tell. So you have to do 100 and, and, and uh, to, to indeed uh, extract that juice, that phenomenal revenue. And that is the, that is the algorithm. That, that's the formula. That's the equation. Uh, it's very difficult to, to, to find a publisher that indeed uh, can go beyond those numbers. So seven strategies for a viable business uh, uh, mobile uh, uh, video uh, strategy. First, uh, pre-roll, pre-roll. Do not release any video that doesn't have pre-roll. Uh, the exception, of course, is breaking news video. Yeah, if there's a terrible accident or a crash, you really do not want to put a pre-roll out before seeing uh, those dramatic images, yes? And that means using traditional avenues to, to indeed uh, engage. So that means if you're going for pre-roll initially, you have to viralize it. So not just put it on your platform, but other platforms uh, as well, if it's just dependent entirely on pre-roll. Second, uh, launch products with more manageable costs. Uh, that means partnering with, uh, with content providers uh, who just cut your check and, and you just buy the package. And, uh, in the book, we go into a lot of detail about those kind of deal making and, and, and how that works. Uh, Luch uh, products with, with, with lower streaming costs. The streaming cost, the bandwidth is phenomenal, yes? That means in article or in stream video ads, uh, those have a lower resolution and indeed they play out much, much quicker. And uh, articles that begin streaming with the volume muted. The volume, believe it or not, uh, it, it's, it, it has a lot of uh, demands on bandwidth. And if you mute the volume, that means you have to create a piece of content that at the beginning you don't miss the key point, yes? So you have to leave a bit of pre-roll that is muted and still makes sense. And to create branded video content for clients. Um, that's an obvious one. We just saw wonderful examples from the New York Times on this. Uh, custom brand integrations, native content opportunities, and so on. And amortize your videos. We look at how Time Inc. and Meredith, uh, it's wonderful how they're repurposing uh, evergreen content. And they have a team who's aware of what's in the library, and they're constantly putting it back, putting it back. And be, you'd be surprised. Something that played out uh, two years ago, you bring it back and it goes viral. Uh, so just because it didn't do well in the past is no indication that it will not do well uh, in the future. So amortizing your video and having a video team that's very much obsessed and focused on repurposing your content. Uh, creating videos using still photography. Yes, so that Ken Burns, you remember Ken Burns was a groundbreaking documentary making, maker in America. I needed these videos which is zoom in and out of Civil War photographs and so on. Uh, so you don't have to go out and film uh, you can indeed do wonderful video with photographs. And finally, videos that make money. So there are additional uh, built-in mechanisms to make money. In the book, we talk about L Canada, uh, Fuse Media, uh, with Dior, with Ford, with Victoria's Secret, with Gillette. Uh, they're doing click-to-buy uh, videos, get-the-look videos, and, uh, and, and, and some other really clever uh, techniques to indeed uh, make money from the video no matter what, uh, provided you get a number of people clicking and buying. And the hottest spot for video today, without a doubt, it is uh, Facebook. Uh, we've seen in some markets that Facebook has overtaken YouTube in terms of video plays. In three markets already, this is happening on a regular basis. This is where the video platforms uh, are really succeeding and where people are sharing them uh, obsessively much more than YouTube, and that trend, I think, is continuing. So, right, that's, that's it for the book. Uh, and um, 
Let me just leave you with, with one reminder that innovation, as we like to say all the time, really does start at the top. It's fine and good to listen to our presentation, our insights, and these wonderful cases, uh, and it's very useful, but it really has to start at the top of your organization. Uh, we still see people make this mistake over and over again of creating innovation labs, or the vice president for innovation. Uh, it's just uh, deeply, deeply wrong. It sends the wrong message that innovation is just uh, for a few or for the mavericks or for the crazy or for the digital natives. Uh, if you really want to transform your organization, it has to apply to everyone. To change your culture, you have to change uh, your future. Uh, change is what we do uh, at Innovation. We are enablers of change. We're doing this globally uh, with uh, clients all over the world. This is just some of our clients in the last uh, 12 months. And really what drives us is that what really matters in this business, in addition to getting on this bandwagon of this new, fantastic, and brilliant, and, and profitable digital future, is journalism. Going back to that, uh, listening to those editors, those wild ideas, uh, those crazy people that made this business, yes. Editors who indeed focus on still, still great writing. None of this is sustainable with good copy, which is the, the, the basis. Video does not replace copy. Video still mostly has copy driving it. Constant reinvention. Editors that pick up gadgets with, with both hands. If your editor is not in his office with a virtual reality vomiting. <laughs> uh, he's the wrong editor. I'm sorry. He should be rushing to the news. Look at this stuff. Wow. It doesn't matter the age. But you've got to have editors with his attitude. But fear, fear is what holds us back. The, in, when we begin these transformations with companies, the inertia is phenomenal. The fear of the unknown just draws people back to a comfort level. And you need that creativity because it is the fuel of innovation. And if you accept change, as I like to say, you, you really never grow old. So it's time to innovate in this business with a clear way forward. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Juan.